Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll start really quick. So just a little bit about me before I get into this. Uh, I grew up 60 miles south of Buffalo, so I love this weather. Thank you, California. In a small country town, actually a hamlet of under 500 people. So one flashing light, one bar, went to the same building from kindergarten through 12th grade. Needless to say, dying to get out, got to New York City at 22, built a marketing media services company, sold it when I was 26, co-founded an ad agency thereafter, which we sold to a large Japanese beauty conglomerate, Shiseido, in 2017. And I give you this journey because one of the things that I've wanted to do my entire life was really focus on the income inequality and wage gap that exists in our country, having grown up in and around poverty, my objective and sort of big lofty vision was how do I solve for increasing wages and really focusing my efforts on the food service business because it employs 10% of America's workforce. So we're gonna get into the pizza thing, but I wanted to kind of frame that in terms of why we're here, why we built a brand and pizza around an ampersand, which really was about doing the right thing, lifting up the lowest wage workers in this country and really promoting unity. Wow, okay. So normally I would be wearing a suit and tie, but I'm just um, taking a key from my <laughs> customer here. Uh, so my name is Alex Garden. I'm the uh, founder and, and CEO of Zoom. And uh, actually, Michael and I met about two years ago uh, because we have a similar background. So I dropped out of high school. I didn't go to college. Uh, and was actually basically homeless when I was 15 and uh, had a similar path. So we're motivated by the same things. Uh, my, my journey to get here is a little different. Um, I've been in the technology industry for 30 years now. I've worked for NASA and JPL, uh, robotic uh, control systems, uh, optics, uh, things that are flying around in space right now. Um, I ran Xbox Live for Microsoft. I was the president of Zynga. And I was the co-CEO of a company you may not have heard of in South Korea called Nexon. But when we took it public on the Nikkei in 2009, we had 550 million customers. Uh, so I've also done a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but the salient point is I'm new to the restaurant uh, and food world. I only joined five years ago, and it's been uh, a tremendous learning opportunity. Uh, the reason I'm in food is because I've devoted the rest of my career to service and to trying to make a difference in the world. And food is the single highest point of leverage and controlling quality of life around the world, in our opinion. And hopefully, in the time we have left, we can tell you a really compelling story about how we're going after this together. Absolutely. Cool. Yep. All right. All right, so uh, basically, uh, just so you know, uh, we were so inspired by Mark's talk yesterday that this morning we threw our entire presentation out and rewrote it. So this is a little ad hoc, but uh, hopefully you'll find it, uh, you'll, hopefully you'll find it uh, really relevant. Uh, so thank you, Mark, for the inspiration. Yeah, so as I was mentioning before, you know, in doing some research around you know, food service employment rates, which is wild, I mean, we're actually taking jobs from the industrialization of America and shifting them into food service you know, looking at, okay, have this big dream of really having high impact on wages and food service. What's the industry inside of food service that I'm going to target? And when I started researching pizza, you know, it was pretty ironic that you had, and if anyone is here representing big pizza, you can sort of close your ears right now, but you have four companies, generally speaking, at the top, right, representing about 50% of what at the time was a $45 billion a year industry really, really focus predominantly on lower wages, minimum wages, lower quality food, and under what I would call sort of a morally bankrupt umbrella. And if you get into Big Pete's and you start doing your research, you're going to find pretty quickly that they are the drivers behind keeping the minimum wage at $7.25 an hour and keeping basic nutritional information like calorie counts off of menus. So I'm sitting here saying, OK, this is 2009, 2010. There's got to be a better way to go about this, a better way to serve pizza, right, get pizza to the people that is higher quality, right, that does promote affordable and living wages and can do so around a socially conscious umbrella. So I have been a very active sort of fight for 15 uh, warrior. Uh, I've introduced the last two raise the wage acts in Capitol Hill with Senator Sandley's Pulitzer and Schumer. And uh, the idea behind that is just doing the right thing by our people, but also taking that and, and really going to show that we care about the communities that we serve and the friends and family you know, of our tribe members. Uh, who are very loyal to our company. So the idea was we are going to do everything that Big Pizza didn't do, and as a result of that, hopefully become Big Pizza's worst nightmare, which is basically the challenge or disruptive brand that's going to sort of flip it on its head. So, you know, something that Mark said yesterday resonated uh, with me from my time as a CEO running large uh, multinational enterprise. Uh, I'm really lucky to have gone into multiple sectors and helped disrupt multiple sectors. And one of the things that is universally true in my experience is 
the following. Uh, if you read the 10K reports from any of those four companies, they all make a similar claim at the beginning of their 10K. They say, we only really compete with one or two other companies. And that's something that I know is that if you read, if you go into any industry where leaders think that's true, uh, it's essentially an invitation to be disrupted. So uh, I couldn't agree more with your perspective on big pizza. So why don't you talk a little bit about yeah, your approach to bricks and mortar? Yeah, and I think you know one of the things that, that was said last night that I felt like was really interesting, when you're targeting you know, a legacy industry, or you're trying to grow market share, but don't necessarily have the capital or undercapitalized because the challenger brands, and a lot of you are in here, um, that are sort of new to this industry or have been playing in the space for the last decade, we don't have hundreds of millions of dollars on our balance sheet yet. And so sort of to bridge the gap between having less capital put to work to truly disrupt and change and grow, we have to use creativity as our weapon. And so how do you weaponize creativity? Now, it helps for me that I had an ad background because I spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to build sort of a creative first brand, first company, and how well those businesses tend to outperform others that aren't as focused on it. And so really starting to think about all of the ways, and it's funny because coming off the last presentation, that we can kind of reimagine what a pizza shop experience is. And so these are some hero images. This is actually a location of ours in Wall Street. Uh, there's one in, in Philly. That one's in New York and in, in Nomad. And this is actually in Boston, Harvard Square. You can just see it doesn't really look or feel the way that you're accustomed to experiencing pizza, and that's incredibly intentional. So not just the fact that the product is shaped differently, the product package actually is highly intentional. We designed our packaging around what it's like to unbox an Apple keyboard. You can kind of see a lot of people look at premium experiences, how do we sort of grab onto those experiences and make them our own, and then designing pizza shops that really look nothing like a pizza shop, but actually do. Right? So people are starting to recognize when you walk into our four walls, you're going to see and feel and experience something very differently. And these are highly localized, too. So a lot of the inspiration doesn't come from designing in communities and taking what's there, but kind of like grasping the culture and saying, how do we design around culture? Like, what's the vibe of this neighborhood? And how do we add value to it versus just trying to come in here and sell pizza? So uh, I don't know if this is true, but a uh, show of hands, or you can just laugh if you like. Uh, how many people here uh, enjoy getting phone calls from companies that say, I'm from technology, and the good news is I'm here to save your business. I would have expected more laughter than that, because uh, that seems to be what we hear from our customers, is they're sick and tired of getting those phone calls. So clearly, I'm an offender. But just in my defense, uh, five years ago, when we joined the food space, we started by uh, with, with no technology. We started a company called Zoom Pizza. And we spent four and a half years in production, hundreds and millions of orders to customers. Uh, I've done deliveries uh, extensively, uh, tens of thousands of deliveries on my own, Just going to customers' homes uh, on peak nights. I've worked in the kitchens. Uh, we've gone through all the food safety problems and everything else. And we built this food company, and then we created technology to solve its problems. Now, I'm sure we make mistakes as technologists, but we think of ourselves as a food company who happens to use technology and not a tech company disrupting food. We think of ourselves as an enterprise company who are here to support our customers. Um, I'm even wearing it today. Uh, not, as a, uh, not as a tech company that's going to help you fix your business, because your business isn't broken. People, uh, this is central to our thesis, people will continue to eat, uh, and you are the experts in hospitality. So what we're going to talk about next is a very uh, unusual, uh, but becoming more uh, common, um, approach to supporting your existing bricks and mortar business, your existing customer relationships, but making it more profitable and protecting the investments that you've made already, which is hopefully a little bit different than the approach you see from most tech companies. Absolutely. And so one of the things I think is important is when you think about creativity, you saw the visual, right, the sort of experiential design-oriented creativity, which really helps. And that's led to, at least and Pizza, really generating sort of best-in-class numbers. Uh, our unit economics are extremely powerful. We're a 23% margin business, where our cash-on-cash -cash returns are south of 50%. And we have basically 2x the revenue that a traditional pizza shop would have in the industry. And so getting it right from an experiential standpoint, people that are walking in the doors, right, queuing up in line or ordering pizza from us, that has worked extremely well. The challenge with that is that we are always going to be limited by, again, the amount of capital that we can raise. We've raised about $70 million in growth capital to date, uh, raising more money in the next six months. But limit to the time that it takes to physically build out brick and mortar, hmm. right? The, 
capital intensive nature of a company owned and operated model. I'm very big on company owned and operated because I believe fundamentally that part of being creatively led is leaning into innovation. And you really have to spend a lot of time and energy and effort on the innovation side of things, not just like the digitally enabled or tech enabled everything, but like it's changing. It's really hard in a franchise model to be able to keep up right, with innovation because you have to convince your business partners who are owning and operating restaurants to do the same and spend their own money when quite frankly, a lot of franchise operators, they just want to generate the greatest return on invested capital and that invested capital happened at a single time. So changing down the road is not a good thing. Or there's an example of five guys where it took them three years to roll out a milkshake program, right? Because when the sales were coming down, no one wanted to spend the money. And as a result of that, that's not a great way to innovate. So the idea behind it is how do we really think about growth? And not just growth for growth's sake, but in a partnership with Zoom, how do we flip the idea of we don't necessarily just have to make and sell pizza out of pizza shops we can sort of create any production model and sell pizza. And so when I reached out to Alex, which is actually, I guess you could say I, I cold called you vis-a-vis -vis LinkedIn because I read an article yeah, about we, Zoom. Yeah, we met online. Yeah, we met online. <laughs> and I was like, hey, dude, like, seems like you're doing some cool stuff. Like, let's talk. And literally, he wrote me back within 24 hours. We hopped in a phone call, shared our vision for you know, affordable and living wages and how we both want to disrupt pizza. He had a much bigger, sort of broader vision. I was a little more focused under the pizza and restaurant industry umbrella. And that's what led to us started talking about how can we build out and partner on a lower CapEx model mm -hmm. and innovative new formats where we basically can put our pizza shop on wheels and sort of digitally enabled experience and go into the next chapter of our business, which was we got the experience, we knew how to make and sell pizza inside of four walls, but really leaning into the next big opportunity, which is delivery. Yeah, so um, very briefly, I'll, I'll talk about what these are because I know a lot of people in the audience are probably thinking, oh, I don't understand this, it's a food truck, right? Like, let me just create permission for you to, to say out loud what you're thinking. Uh, if only it were that easy. Uh, from the federal, state, and local government's perspective, these aren't food trucks, they're actually kitchens. Uh, they're 28 foot long boxes with a 20 foot stainless steel kitchen. We have 42 kilowatts of power on board, 220, 120, 12 volt, high speed data, um, fire suppression and climate control, um, and what makes them really uh, clean and, com and clean compressed air, clean and gray water, and what makes them really special is that they're completely generic on the inside. In fact, if you were to take a truck before it's been kitted, it's, it's empty. It has a very um, special racking system on two foot centers and any equipment that racks into that just plugs in and works. And that means that you have infinite flexibility in the equipment that you load, your protocols, how you configure your flow for efficiency and other things. And um, then it's backed with extensive uh, uh, AI for positioning, uh, for inventory forecasting, waste management. Uh, and then it has a really sophisticated KDS. Actually, I think it's probably the most efficient KDS in the world now that lets, um, in some cases, like if I can use an example from you guys, two operators can do 120 orders an hour, $5,000 a day out of 180 square feet. And it's completely generic. It's not built for pizza. And now, can I talk about the thing we're doing with the yeah. pizza? Yeah, so now we're actually taking that KDS and putting it in bricks and mortar. Because if you can imagine, it makes bricks and mortar super efficient. And that lets us do some really special tricks with unified order dispatching from marketplaces and other things. And in fact, some of our technology, we have a technology called Wait to Cook that takes a little while to explain, but here's the punchline. When you have a unified KDS across bricks and mortar and the trucks, you reduce dwell on every order by between five to seven minutes. So you think about the sensory impact of that, it's out of control. So I'll just show you a really quick video, it's a minute and 30 seconds. This is an example of one of our standard configurations. It's not too far off actually from the one that you guys use.
So um, the we music actually, cracked me up. Pardon me. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to dance to the music. Well, I did I realize like, that that music yeah, was super no, off ding, ding. for you guys. I should yeah. have put some kind of like good death metal or something in there. I apologize uh, for <laughs> not doing that. It just didn't seem food, food forward for me. Uh, so um, uh, we could go into a lot of detail on the back end systems that make these things actually work. But one thing you might have noticed if you were looking at the brand um, uh, serial numbers of that equipment, some of it's off the shelf stuff. Some of it's things that we had to make because it turns out no company on earth makes a uh, 50 state compliant four compartment sink that fits into a 36 uh, uh, inch uh, safety aisle that has enough cleaning gray water to pass codes. So we actually had to build a whole global supply chain around these trucks and around the equipment that goes on them. And uh, just to answer a question that everybody usually asks, like how do you get one? We don't actually sell them to you uh, unless you're a very large enterprise customer, we lease them. So it looks just like occupancy and it ends up being less expensive than a bricks and mortar restaurant with the same basic returns from an economic standpoint. Um, but we're not going to get into any of these things, but these are just a selection of these sort of radical new um, uh, uh, ways you can configure your business when you bring this new technology out. But I think you want to go through a couple of highlights. Yeah, I think there, there's a few trends to key in on, which is the first thing is recognizing that you know, owning your own delivery ecosystem, right, which at one point was a monopoly and companies spent decades building and refining, yeah. right, that no longer necessarily is a competitive advantage given the democratization of delivery through the third party market. Well, I'm not sure if you can call a 30% take rate democracy. Fair, true. And I think the second big part is that you know, the shift in everything moving to off-premise, and that's not going to change. Right? That's only going to be amplified and given what we've seen even the past couple of weeks, well, virus-related. Yeah. We talked about that this morning. So you know, with the COVID-19 thing that's happening, I mean, obviously, I hope, I'm sure all of you hope that it goes away, right? It doesn't become a big change. But if we look around the world to countries where this is uh, really, unfortunately, taking hold and changing people's way of lives, they're being confined to their homes. Now, what do you think is going to happen to a delivery habits if people are confined to their home for a couple of weeks? It's going to fundamentally shift the attitudes that the majority of Americans have towards at-home convenience. So we're going to see a massive change in attitudes toward delivery over the next, I think, probably six to eight weeks. Yeah, and it's not going anywhere. I think when, when you take a look at that and you also even look at Domino's last report where they're focused on their carryout business, it says that delivery is going to become increasingly more competitive and challenging. And that was interesting to me because you have a, a brand that sort of is right at the top of the mountain now telling people that we're going to focus on getting people to a Domino's. And like the last time I stumbled across a Domino's, I took two left wrong turns. And their one was because their strategy has not been like A, real estate in A markets. It's been C, real estate in every market mm -hmm. and basically making sure they can penetrate you know, an entire market very quickly and deliver from point A to point B in under 30 minutes. And so for us, given the fact that the experiential side, while wildly important, like needs to be dialed up. And I love the prior presentation because we should all be thinking about that for our bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. But given the fact that people are consuming more and more food now in their homes, in their offices, they don't have to go there. We are not, and we do not need to be limited by brick and mortar in terms of how we produce food and how we get food to point A, point a to point B. There's a much more cost effective way, and this is what that provides. So for us, it's fortressing markets. We have 14 of these coming into Washington, D.C., where we're headquartered, and we're literally putting them in pockets right, of the market that it doesn't make sense to build out a traditional brick and mortar. It helps reduce delivery times in general from the pizza shops from 30 minutes down to 20 minutes because we have more penetration, more coverage, and it's a very sort of light CapEx model because we can work with Zoom on a leasing basis, mm -hmm. so we're not actually coming up with the cash out of pocket. So all of a sudden, you know, our 20 locations, we have about 40 now in total, our 20 locations in the DMV can become 34 locations literally overnight. And now our, our ability to market and get pizza that's hotter, faster to a customer for the in real price. time on five, demand for five the same price. Seven minutes exactly same right. Price, yeah. Also allows us to go into brand damaging zones that we wouldn't want to build out a traditional pizza shop. This is an interesting way to do it. And what I'm really excited about is dynamic pricing, which means that, because this is a digitally enabled experience, which is we can actually on the minute, on the hour, change the pricing of the pie. If the pizza is on average 10 bucks, it can drop to nine, nine fifty, eight, eight fifty, eight twenty-five. It's a higher margin business. Or if so you're peak orders, you can actually go up. Exactly right. right. Yeah. So like, think about that. Like, restaurants have not been because people get pissed. You go into a restaurant, pricing changes. People complain, but when they're doing it on an app or through text message like our platform, they're just less sensitive to it. So you have wild, wild ability to all of a sudden do 
real end-to-end -end, mm -hmm. you know, creative marketing and dynamic pricing that really uplift sales. So 3 p.m., our pizza goes from $10 to $9 because 3 p.m., it's a harder time to sell pizza. So uh, I know we're over time. We want to get finished on time and get everyone back on schedule, but I'll just uh, leave you with one sort of, one of my favorite anecdotes, it's super creative. So you can see this beautiful truck uh, parked in a location where I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have gotten signage rights from the municipality. What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's accurate. Yeah, it's not Photoshop. That's actually yeah. there. Uh, so here's the deal. Uh, these are 29 foot long billboards that you can park anywhere in any city with no previous permitting. And uh, Michael actually came up with, I think my favorite scenario, unusual customer driven scenario for these. So when they open a bricks and mortar location, they negotiate, depending on where it is, rights with the landlord that allow them to park one of these trucks in front of the location for free during the term of the lease while they're doing the build out. And that means that on the day the bricks and mortar restaurant opens, customers have already adopted habits around that location and off the truck goes to do something else, which means your cash on cash on the build out goes through the roof. It's amazing. And you're porting over, generally speaking, because our ratings are so high with mobile kitchens, we're usually like a 4849 on like a DoorDash or an Uber Eats you're basically taking that theoretical tablet out of a mobile kitchen, putting it into a pizza shop, and you have hundreds of reviews, all very high rating, built-in revenue, which means that you don't have to now spend pre-open marketing dollars. It's already, it's already been done, and it's revenue-generated dollars that have marketed the business, and now you're flipping a switch, and instantly you're not dealing with the sales yeah. ramp that you typically see. So uh, we'll close with that, but I think this is the, the salient point that I wanted to end with. So, you know, we're an enterprise company, we're a platform company, and we exist for the express purpose of helping you support your business in the way that you want to run it. And we thought we knew all the clever ways in which these kitchens could be used, and it turns out we knew about 10% of them. And what's really inspiring is to see the ways that our customers are adopting them and how it's helping them improve the system level economics and performance of their business. So uh, with that, we'll end it up. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you.